。やっぱり気づいたか、俺の存在に。ええ、始めたか。この通りだと。あらあらあいつら翻訳地に使ってるんかいい
もしかしてあの空をかける少女で史上最強って言ったかああそうサーディーと浮き上がっちゃう遠藤さんもやっぱり真帆さんもやっぱりやっぱり,やっぱり狙われたかったわそこへはハグっとは11時間。say that the characteristics of a Nordic education system is that, first of all, we have a very inclusive system based on public funding where there should be a room for all. Uh, I think students are taught to think independently, a lot of critical thinking and also quite a lot of creativity baked into our education. I would especially commend the Finnish system where they have, where they put their best teachers for the youngest students and they use a lot of resources in preschool and also first to third grade to ensure that the children are best possibly equipped for future learning. And I believe that that's the best investment you can make is to invest in the kids when they're really young so you lay the foundation for their future learning. Actually, the, the biggest threat for, from 
side of security for Europe. Of course, you can, you can concentrate and, and focus on the, on the security side, but I would take it a bit on the other side that if we really go to focus too much on the security side, then it really would slow down uh, our development. I think it is the, the biggest threat is that we lose competitiveness. And, and that is for me the, the whole part, because if we want to be leaders in innovation, we should also know innovation, it has two aspects. First, I think you must have great ideas, but you must be the first. So that means speed. And we must make sure that I think we have an ability to be innovative and, and to be the first and to have speed. So for me, that is the biggest threat of cybersecurity, to get the slow down. actually the, the biggest threat for, from cyber security for Europe. Of course, you can, we can concentrate and, and focus on the, on the security side, but I would take it a bit on the other side, that if we really go to focus too much on the security side, then and it really would slow down uh, our development. I think it is the, the biggest threat is that we lose competitiveness. And, and that is for me the, the whole part, because if we want to be leaders in innovation, we should also know innovation, it has two aspects. First, I think you must have a great idea, but you must be the first. So that means speed. And we must make sure that I think we have an ability to be innovative and, and to be the first and to have speed. So for me, that is the biggest threat of cybersecurity, to get the slow down. suffering from uh, eco-anxiety. Um, the simple answer is yes, possibly too much. Uh, eco-anxiety is definitely triggered by the fact that we are facing a very urgent matter with climate, but at the same time, it's also because we're facing something that is very complex. It's very difficult to understand the impact of climate change, and it's very difficult to understand the solutions uh, to reach a low carbon economy. So in the world of investment, where, where I am, what I see is that those who are actually acting every day to invest in climate change investments and low carbon economy investments are actually less susceptible to eco-anxiety because they can see the result and the impact of what they do. But uh, really what is needed to, to decrease this anxiety is more examples of uh, impactful investment, uh, change of behavior in society that would actually bring people to uh, less anxiety. situation where U.S. and West European support for Ukraine was very well coordinated and uh, we were maintaining a consistent pressure on Russia to uh, begin to negotiate seriously about ending its occupation of eastern Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, I think now the impeachment dynamics in the U.S. have really knocked U.S. policy off the table. Uh, we don't have the people, we don't have the engagement, we don't have the, the same focus. And as a result, I think that takes a lot of the pressure off of Russia to negotiate. Uh, I'm hopeful that as we have a Normandy format summit, possibly on the, uh, December 9th, it may take a little bit longer, um, that that can retain some of that negotiating dynamic. Um, but I'm afraid that right now the, uh, the situation is much more difficult for Ukraine than it should be. civil society in modern Russia. I would say it's a very important issue. Why? Because in Russia, political competition is limited, there are no real opposition parties, so the society stands up to the autocratic regime through organizing itself, through building trust, through providing
providing public goods that a corrupt and inefficient state cannot provide. And it's not just protesting corruption. It's not just about uh, asking for democracy and rule of law. Civil society today is working on helping the poor, helping the disadvantaged, fighting domestic violence, uh, promoting gender equality, de defending minorities. So this is actually where the European future for Russia is. And luckily, with a new communication technology with internet, it's easier to organize itself, it's easier to inform itself, and it's easier to promote change, creating new Russia that eventually will become part of greater Europe. troops are stationed at the border between Estonia uh, and Russia to uh, deter uh, possible Russian aggression. When uh, President Macron is speaking about what he calls a staff de concentrique, um, when citizens in Moldova and Georgia are questioning whether Europe and the US will come to rescue uh, if there is a security guarantee, and when sanctions against Russia uh, and counter embargoes have become kind of uh, the very essence of the idea of the European uh, uh, security policy. Well, what can we expect from Russia? We know that Putin is actually more popular than most of his competitors. Um, but will uh, Medvedev be a different leader than Putin? In short, can we expect uh, a different kind of trajectory from Russia in the coming years, when the bureaucratic elite inside Russia is focusing more on digitalization than what some might call modernization. As always, the views on Russia are diverging. Basically, when you, when you look at the state of innovation in Europe, uh, I think there are three fundamental trends that you need to be aware of, or these are sort of three fundamental facts of how innovation has been evolving over the last few years, and uh, I would say that those three are. The first is that uh, talent is being concentrated in very tight and small clusters, and this is very atypical and unexpected. We thought the digital economy would distribute talent geographically and people would simply connect to processes of different types, but the truth of the matter is that actually there's something about knowledge, particularly this form tacit knowledge that doesn't travel very well. So we're, we're seeing these very tight clusters emerge in places like Boston or Silicon Valley or Hong Kong or Singapore or others around particular areas of knowledge. But the second development that I think is significant is that we're also seeing a concentration of productivity growth in very particular companies, what the OECD calls frontier firms. And productivity over the last uh, 10 years has really skyrocketed in those firms, but has stalled in every other firm within the market. So a few firms have become highly competitive and more so over time, and others are just simply falling behind in terms of growth. 
The third fact that I think is significant is the geographic distribution of those companies and of innovation. So we can see that China and the U.S. concentrate almost all of the startups that we could term unicorns that have a, a value of more than a billion dollars uh, today, mostly again in China and in the U.S. So there are big gaps around the world. There are a few in Europe. So what this depicts is a world of concentrated talent, concentrated productivity growth, and a, an empty hinterland with these very particular clusters of startups and innovators. And this poses, I think, major challenges challenges to Europe. Fundamentally, I would say two. One is we need to attract these firms who want to have high quality and numerous jobs in the future. And we need to attract these companies if we want to have fiscal traction and be able to fund public services moving forward and sustain our social contract. So if I was a policymaker, and this is my final message, and it has been uh, in the session uh, today, it would be we need to focus our economic policy on developing these frontier firms, providing them with the talent, providing them with the frameworks and the capacity to grow and do well and innovate and bring wealth, jobs, and tax revenue. Uh, to Europe. And if we don't do this, uh, I think we're going to face a major challenge of employment and public service funding. Thank you.
fraction to lose price, but they would produce as much as they could good to capture market share, and um, and that would in fact end up bringing down the price considerably because so much more oil was added to the global market. The demand shock, however, was much more significant than the supply uh, additions that the Russians and the Saudis put on the market. The demand shock has been massive. Um, think about the world consuming 100 million barrels of oil a day in February of this year. That dropped by 20 million barrels of oil a day um, later in the quarter in April, maybe even more. We're still trying to get fidelity on those numbers. But a huge drop in demand that resulted basically from the immobilization of the global economy. And, you know, this, this is kind of what took us to that period where we had negative oil prices in the United States. And, um, a, a, and we also had an unprecedented uh, global response to the collapse of oil markets because it was important not just for oil producers, but also something of this magnitude had real implications for the global economy. So we did see an effort to kind of restore balance to the market um, with an agreement that came back in April. And we've started to see oil markets um, regain their footing. Prices are now back up to about $35, $40 a barrel, which is still quite low, but certainly much better than it was a few weeks ago if you're looking at it from the perspective of the oil Do we know that, um, you know, we're going through this disruption, and oftentimes disruption or crisis present different opportunities. Um, so how does this disruption, uh, what potential does it have to transform geopolitics in the world? Sure. Um, it's a big question, and I would simply, uh, you know, the lens that I look at this from is that um, energy has always been a really big driver of global politics. That's what my whole book that you mentioned at the outset, Windfall, was about. Um, so often we don't think about energy as a driver of foreign policy, but it is. Um, energy, and if we think about oil um, in particular, has defined alliances, it's defined, um, you know, who has power in the international system. It has been the spark for wars, and sometimes been the, the um, impetus for cooperation. So, you know, energy has always been a big driver of foreign policy. And what we see is when there are big disruptions, as the one we're talking about in energy, in oil in particular, that often leads to big changes in energy. So this moment certainly has been a big one for oil and gas and energy, generally speaking. And how its geopolitical impacts will unfold really depend on how long-lasting this um, this disruption is, um, whether or not demand comes back for oil, or whether it remains tapered out for some time and then creates a window for renewables and alternatives to come forward. So I would say you know, there's one, I'll be brief here, uh, just trying to highlight a, a bunch of things, but you know, one possibility is that this crisis really accelerates the movement towards a, a, a greener global energy mix. Um, the energy transition that people have been talking about for a long time, but the world has been very slow to act on. So it's possible these changes could accelerate that, and that could bring about a lot of geopolitical implications in terms of you know, removing oil as a real source of power and elevating countries that invest in technologies and have to use renewables and a variety of other things. But even if that dramatic outcome doesn't occur in the immediate short term, we have a lot of countries around the world that are experiencing major economic duress because of this collapse in oil prices. Um, and this is going to cause a lot of politics to shift trajectories. Saudi Arabia is one of them. Their reform efforts are going to be more difficult. Russia, it's interesting. A lot of talk about um, Putin's hand being a little diminished in Russia these days because of the combination of the oil price collapse and the COVID crisis. Um, and we can also talk about how U.S.-China relations have been affected by all of this. So I definitely think even if we don't see a big impetus to an energy transition, although I hope we do. Even if we don't, we're going to see some lasting geopolitical imprints. So thank you. And I just want to, want to remind our audience, to ask Megan a question, please use the Q&A button that's on your screen, and to interact with your fellow audience members, you can use the chat function. So I want to uh, stay there for a second, Megan. Let's talk about China and the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, and do you see the potential for China to emerge as a global leader after the, you know, during during and after the recovery of this COVID crisis? Um, do you think China will become a driver of alternative forms of energy? Sure. Well, 
there's a lot in that question. I mean, U.S.-China relations, like, like all of these questions. So, um, the U.S.-China relationship, um, you know, is really in a downward spiral. I would say experts, people who've been watching this relationship for decades say this is really the worst moment since 1978 when Shopping opened up the economy. Um, and that it is a worse relationship than it was uh, after Tiananmen Square, which says quite a lot. Um, and I think it's a combination of factors. The relationship was already on rocky footing, and there was a change in the there's a, there's a change in the American political attitude, both of Democrats and Republicans, about the proper way for the U.S. to interact with China, even before the COVID crisis. But the COVID crisis has really accelerated this in a pretty dramatic fashion. Um, what does this mean, as you asked, for China's global leadership role, first just in general, and then when it comes to renewable energy? I think um, it, it's very much an open question. I think you know China's standing has taken a hit internationally, but I'd also point out that the U.S. standing has taken a hit internationally as well. And so I think it, it, this is true not just for the politics of both countries and for the global image and soft power of both countries, but also for their economies. So the question is who, which country is better poised to recover from this, to take advantage of this global disruption and assert themselves and, um, and, their, and their leadership. Um, again, a lot remains open, but certainly uh, China has shown more of a desire to do that. The United States seems to be retreating from global leadership roles rather than looking for opportunities to enhance them. Um, but China has some you know, domestic challenges to, to, to handle as well. In terms of renewable energy, China definitely was uh, positioning itself to be a global leader in that, in terms of its investments, its commitments, its national strategies, um, and also because the United States did not have, does not have, a national strategy to be a leader in what will be an incredibly important um, sector for the global economy going forward. So um, China, I think their, their focus has shifted a little bit since the COVID crisis, focusing more on just ensuring there's enough economic growth to prevent social unrest. But I imagine um, that they haven't lost sight of the importance of green energy in um, their overall economic strategy. So I'm going to cover an audience question, and so we're going to take a little tour around the world. We have an audience question about how has the oil crisis and the COVID crisis impacted sort of the geopolitical situation in Venezuela? Sure. Um, I mean, Venezuela, um, I mean, one, when you think about countries that are vulnerable to oil shocks and major decreases in the price of oil, you would immediately think of Venezuela because over the last couple of decades, Venezuela has become one of the most oil dependent countries in the world in the sense that um, it used to be a more vibrant economy, but over the span of the last two decades or so, basically, um, in Venezuela had imported everything that it consumed except for oil, essentially, and that oil played such a major role. Um, what has happened over the last several years with Maduro in power and the United States really putting pressure on that economy is that um, Venezuela is still oil dependent, but its oil exports are just a mere fraction of what they were a few years ago when, when Venezuela was such a major oil exporter. So a massive decline in the oil price comes to Venezuela, but not as dramatically as it might have a, a few years ago when Venezuela was actually exporting a whole lot. Um, that said, Venezuela is a very scarce on foreign currency, so any diminution is a challenge for the regime. Um,
crisis will bring about some new dynamics, and hopefully some of them will create opportunities. So let's talk about a region that you know very well, the Middle East, and how oil and the oil markets are impacting um, tensions in the region. Sure. Um, I mean, the Middle East is a very heterogeneous place, and so we tend to think about this, particularly in the context of oil, um, low oil prices being bad for the countries of the Middle East, and I think that that's not a wrong supposition. But we also have to keep in mind that there are a lot of countries in the region that are big, um, you know, they're importers of oil. They actually don't produce oil. If you look at Egypt or Jordan or countries that are important um, to the region and to U.S. interests. So th there's a varied impact of this. But in general, I think the big picture is that um, you have countries that are fall into one of two categories. Um, the first categories are countries that um, certainly do not, it, uh, this is not a useful, I'm talking about producers, producers that uh, don't want to see prices this low, but they have policy tools that enable them to kind of weather the storm. And I put Saudi Arabia in that category. Saudi Arabia can raise debt on international markets. It's increased its VAT tax by, uh, it's tripled it in the last couple of months. Um, it has the ability to rein in expenditures. It has policy tools to deal with it. It still is going to be, um, I would say, weakened by this crisis um, because this crisis really detracts from Saudi Arabia's ability to pursue big economic reforms, which were really the focal point of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's endeavors. Um, and it makes it much harder to move away from the oil economy when there, there's no excess revenues to invest in non-oil industries. So there are impacts on a country like Saudi Arabia, but they're not as immediate as that second category of countries where I put Iraq in there, maybe Algeria, Oman, other countries that really don't have a lot of wiggle room. They don't have a pillow. Um, they find that low oil prices means they can't even pay wages, never mind fund health budgets. Security budgets are going to remain unfunded. So this could create some real um, economic and potentially security points of instability in the Middle East on top of a region that we already know is struggling with all of these things. Fantastic. So um, let's move in, you know, domestically uh, now. So in your book, Windfall, you outline how the oil and uh, gas produced by fracking both from the U.S. power company. How will the U.S. oil industry be affected by this unprecedented limit? What does that mean for both large and smaller companies? Sure. So this is an extremely painful moment for U.S. oil producers. Um, we saw a remarkable shift in uh, in President Trump's attitude towards oil prices back in April. In March, he was tweeting, hey, low oil prices, that's great, good for the consumer. Um, but he clearly had a change of heart in April when he saw how dramatic the collapse of the oil industry was and how uh, we actually, again, moved to a position where there were negative oil prices for American oil. Um, and it became clear that the challenges facing the oil industry threatened the industry itself, which many people regard as having national security implications for the United States. Um, and also, I think he and others came to appreciate how big a part of the domestic overall economy America's oil industry is. One of the numbers out there is that 11 million people are employed directly or indirectly by the oil industry. So. Um, there was a shift in attitude towards this um, and an effort, President Trump got very heavily involved in an effort to actually 
years. So I think we're going to still see a healthy and robust industry after this very painful uh, period. Um, and America, in my mind, will still remain a major energy superpower, even if its production numbers are not quite as high as they were in February of 2020. You know, one of the things that you have talked a lot about is um, the world being on the cusp of
provocation happening out of Iran and the potential for the U.S. and Iran getting into an uncomfortable situation again, much like the one that we were at at the beginning of January. I mean, it seems like a thousand years ago, but if you remember at the beginning of January, we were faced with the uh, killing of Qasem Soleimani, senior Iranian government military figure, and the real possibility that the U.S. and Iran would be involved in a kind of a hot conflict. I think that the combination of the economic unrest, um, so keep in mind Iran's economy was under major economic pressure, largely due to sanctions of the United States before the COVID crisis. And the Iranian regime was also having issues related to its own credibility. One of the remarkable things of 2019 was that we're seeing protests against the Iranian government in Iran. We're also seeing them in Iraq. So the Iranian regime was had a legitimacy problem going back a year ago, or many years ago, but we were seeing manifestations of it a year ago. Then you have um, the, the shooting down of the civilian airliner by the Iranian military. Then you have the COVID crisis, which um, really uh, was pretty devastating in Iran. And then you have a further oil price collapse, which harms Iran, but very much in the same way as Venezuela. All of this creates enormous stress on the society and presumably on the Iranian government, leading us to, to really, I think we should be paying attention to the fact that we don't know how the Iranian government is going to react, um, that it could certainly be an impetus for more provocation, more lashing out, um, and this could lead to a, a further confrontation between U.S. and Iran, so it's definitely something that I would be watching more if our, our radars were not so overloaded with 101 other pressing issues. Absolutely. So we're almost out of time, but um, as our last question, so if we're on the cusp of this global reset, this great opportunity, can you walk us through what your best case scenario would be? Um, sure. I, I'm going to interpret that as relating to the energy realm, but there are other ways I could think about it because, um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to think, just actually moving above the energy realm, I'd like to think that the world could emerge from this moment with new patterns of international cooperation. I feel like that is what is needed, um, which is definitely needed. We think about the challenges facing us, the pandemic being the most obvious and the most immediate, but climate change being another one, um, certainly the global economy being another one. These are all things that one country cannot fix on their own, cannot insulate itself from on its own. And so these issues demand global coordination and cooperation to address them in the best way possible, in the most equitable way possible. So to me, I think, you know, what this moment underscores is the need for cooperation. And as an American, for me, it underscores the need for American America has, it is, I think, devastating to many people to see that America has not taken a leadership role and, in fact, has withdrawn from the WHO during this period of global need. So that's what I'd like to see. Um, if I were putting a bet on whether that would emerge as the dominant scenario, I wouldn't, I wouldn't place zero on that scenario. I think a lot depends on our November election. Um, um, but I, I think that's certainly not the direction we're heading, and that concerns me. So the best case scenario, more global cooperation, more um, more kind of acknowledgement of this critical moment and how it exposes some of the inequalities and inequities in our society, and taking the opportunity that um, is created by the moment and by the fact that, speaking as an American, many Americans have suddenly now um, overnight gotten used to the idea that the government is going to be a bigger part of their daily lives. Well, that could be a negative, but it could also be a positive if our government puts in place certain strategies that prioritize things like an energy transition that are going to be really important to our well-being over the long run. Megan, thank you so much for joining us today. I know we've only scratched the surface here, so hopefully we'll be able to welcome you back, and hopefully in person. And uh, stay safe and well out there. Thank you, Megan. It's been a pleasure. Have a good afternoon. Welcome to Illuminati Silver. We tell the truth about silver.
Today is Saturday, the 26th of February, 2022. We're publishing our Gold and Silver Weekly Update for the week ending the 25th of February. And what a turbulent week it has been. Certainly one to test traders' nerves, that's for sure. So let's take a look. gold and silver we can see that gold fell eight dollars last week falling from 1897 to 1889 having hit a high of 1974 the highest in eight years and a low of 1881 a fall of 0.4% in sterling terms gold finished the week at 1409 pounds that's up 13 pounds and in euros it closed at 1000 676 euros that's unchanged silver did better proportionately it rose 30 cents rising from $23.97 to $24.27 having hit a high of $25.64 and a low of $23.71 a rise of 1.25% in sterling terms silver closed at £18.10 that's up 47 pence and in euros, it closed at 21.53 euros. That's up 0.36 euros. The gold to silver ratio fell from 79.1 to 1 to 77.8. Like equities, cryptocurrencies were extremely volatile. And Bitcoin ended up down $770 and currently stands at $39,237. It was down. $5,000 at one stage on Thursday. The Dow Jones closed on Friday at 34058 That's up 834 points on the day and down 21 a week. The S&P 500 closed at 4085 up 95 on the day and up 37 on the week. And the NASDAQ Composite closed at 13694 up 221 points on the day and up 146 points. Oils, which were also quite turbulent. Brent crude closed at $97.93. Now that's up a whopping $4.39 on the week, though it did touch $104. And had it stayed there, obviously would have been up around $10 for the week. And WTI crude had closed at $91.59. That's just a rise of $0.52. Cents. So WTI crude prices, whilst they also rose quite considerably, underperformed compared with Brent crude. The dollar index stands at 96.61 and that's up 0.57 on the week, though again it was well over 97 under three and a quarter during the course of Thursday. Now we concluded last week's video with the following forecast. We see gold trading between 1850 and 1950 and 1825 to 1975 as outliers. We see silver trading between 23.25 and 24.75 and 22.75 to 25.50 as outliers. Well, we're pleased we extended the gold outlier range to 1975 based on the possible of Ukraine. And to see gold peak at 1974, one less, was indeed gratifying. As was the fall back to our normal trading range by the end of the week. The difference between its high and low for gold was $93, which was the largest for some considerable time. Silver closed well within our normal trading range and operated within it for much of the week. The invasion of Ukraine did, however, push it 14 cents higher than our outlier range. Only we'd said $25.75 instead of $25.50. The difference between its high and low for the week was $1.93, Again, like gold, one of its largest moves for some considerable time. Obviously, price movements were dictated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which caused gold and silver prices to skyrocket, and equities and cryptos to plummet, only to recover again later that day, which was an impressive turnaround. Indeed, so much so that yesterday we published a video entitled what will it take for gold to hit $2,000? And we've placed
listening to that below. Please do listen to that. It covers some interesting aspects that tie in also with our gold class broadcast that we published earlier. Now, whilst all eyes were on Russia last week, some interesting economic data was announced by the United States. Market manufacturing and services flash PMIs were higher than expected, as was the consumer confidence index. Initial jobless claims were down, as was continuing jobless claims. On the negative side, though, PCE inflation, both monthly and year over year, were higher, as was, though, real consumer spending for January. Both actions must now suggest a rate rise short. Now, before we take a more in depth look at gold and silver, it's worth looking at what data is coming out of the US this week. Monday, we have the Chicago PMI for February. Tuesday, the market manufacturing final PMI and the ISM manufacturing index for February and construction spending for January. Wednesday, we have the ADP employment report for February, which may suggest what's going to happen on Friday. And on Thursday, of course, the regular weekly jobless claims and the market services final PMI and the ISM services index, both for February. And we have factory orders for January. Then on Friday, the all important non farm payrolls, unemployment rate, and average hourly earnings for February. So an important week. And in our view, the final determinant week, as far as data is concerned, to enable the FOMC to finally make up its mind about interest rates when it meets on the 15th and 16th of March. Geopolitically, we still have Russian and Ukraine issue, which will no doubt continue for some time. And this will capture most of the headlines for the duration of next week, we suspect. So what is gold looking like technically? Well, it's resting at a major support level of 1888, which is where the 10-day moving average rests. And it has obviously psychologically strong support at 1850, and then extremely strong support at the 50-week EMA at $1,808. Resistance has seen near June's highs of 1916 The MACD histogram is suggesting consolidation. We should not ignore the fact that gold still fell, though, even as the dollar value also fell on Friday. Like gold, silver prices also fell after their burst forward on Thursday morning. Support is seen near the 10-day moving average of 23.93 and resistance at the 200-day moving average of $24.21. Like gold, the MACD is suggesting consolidation. Russia has said that it will consider talks if the Ukraine lays down its arms, while the Ukrainian president stated last night that they will continue to fight. So once again, a prediction for gold and silver this coming week is going to be extremely difficult and almost again and entirely dependent on Russia and Ukraine. That said, there is important economic data being presented, which is likely to have an effect, especially towards the end of the week. So with this in mind, we see gold really trading between 1840 and 1940 and 1810 to 1960 as outliers, though we will be surprised if it gets that high. We see silver trading between 23.50 and 25, and 22.75 to 25.40 as outliers. What do you think? Please do share your thoughts. Meanwhile, thank you for listening. If you like, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to press the bell sign so you're notified of our videos as we publish. And as always, we wish you a safe, enjoyable weekend and prosperous weekend. Illuminati Silver Loan has come background of banking, international wealth management and economics. Having now retired from these worlds, we are not qualified to give investment advice. Therefore this and other productions must not be deemed to be giving such advice and merely represent the personal views of its owners. ここ
ありにいく感謝を受けるかと
1兆円ってどんな予算やねん。四国全域に、うん、半分以上任せてるんだろうね、予算。まさか、ずっと前から、攻撃してるんじゃないのな。まさか。まさか。来てんじゃないのな。まさか。まさか、この報告。お。まさか。この報告。この2008年のサイバーの項目テロやあ何クエイクいるバレてるぞ訓練として残してたクラス最低やんお前らバレてるぞこれ俺の件報告してる何ニーヒさんの件やっぱりやっぱりあの俺はね新聞みたいな中日新聞の時に一般の男性を暴行したので逮捕されたあれ中日新聞もしかして横山以前のやつかもしかして家子辻さん辻子俺で怒ってたんか俺でやりにくい確かにやはり動き団体んとあの点検の道理で潰れたかああ中川さんの件は報告してたわよ言ってたわよああ血まみれ状態本当にいいあの大見小津のああ威力団体だったやろ血まみれだったかどうだよな、高橋。あっちだにもこらん。なにこれ。戦争状態そっちの件やっぱ俺たかお前かやっぱあの人かお,お前かこれポロッカス違反されてるトリキンなにこれエルマファリーズあ
。井上。と多分安藤マリーナへと。本名を書いてた。何？えー、何？本名。ニアでね、ああ、こっちだけ長まで。ロジア大輔とミルってるんだよ。うん、ね、これもしてます。ああ、ぶれた。新幹線にしかああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああああダミアンは滋賀県じゃないなぁ。ガチでした。ナイトや。ミゼーション。なんのことだ、ウェボンミゼーションで。ああ、平気かて。SNS を平気に。これ、上坂すみね。これ、スタートに来る。ああ。こんなお前、まずしたいのお前かお前、うん、お手続き言ってたのはい、長岡にメンツ。埼玉と栃木、襲撃していいぞ。
ወታደራዊ ነበርና ከካቢኔቱ አብሮ ያለው ጆሴፍ ሬትሊንግ ብቻ ነበር ከሹሙ አ やっぱ差別してたよ。何やがこれ。何やがこれ。ソイニ、ソイニビエス。ソイニマイ。ソイニマイ。ソイニマイ。ソイニマイ。ソイニマイ。ソイニマイ。ソイニマイ。ソイニ
何こんなに金融機関集まってる時間かかるあの市役所の外壁の塗装作業。やっぱり無理やりさせられたかやっぱり無理やりさせられたかどういうこと急にできてるできるかこの便所塗装できてるできるかね無理やりさせられたかサーリーさんのことに無理やりさせられたかは安藤やろ安藤だなやろ青だなやろどれなら見てどれでおかしいと思った本当に何でしたこれ公式なんで覚えといて公式なんで覚えておきなさいやっぱみたいに保存したかこっそり石川県知事長たち、なんか新山に何か SNS 条例作りました。なんかあんなやつ、保存の義務化とか。なんか作りました。作りました。多分作ったと思う俺の予想やとな作ったと思う作ったと思う多分間違いない作ったと思う大抵に共通ですからねほらねこれ俺の場合は統一したんだよ統一してるんでいいんやけこの通り英語と中国語、韓国語、先生は英語、キエフとか。意外とチャタムや。英語使いもやったらどうぞ。やばいやばい。会見見てくれたよすごいね<笑>すごいなこれさ何一度こそ<笑>でもあの皆さんおかしいねあいいさすごい。うん、超応援って。四国全土とか、西日本全域。かわいい。うん、これ。ちなみに、あ、取りました。
あサーリーセブンの子です。申告してる場合もないから、ね、もらってたからねそういうのやっぱ YouTube のアプリの登録のアプリの登録のアプリの有料化でやっぱりなこれでいいかいいのを植えていった、批判されてるね。センチュリーやってけ。だからあの、あの、あれ
まあ、させることでできてる。なんか、おみつっぱいやったら、ああ、ね、残念だな、ね、決断か。そうせいさあ、リーソン。お前、なぜか。何使ったこれお前、まさか。すごいよ、これよ、お前。悪魔バカしてよ、これや。こりゃ。やっつけるこりゃ。ジェイアイ、コストリーの3曲乗っ取ってたから、3曲ジャパンの。月に積み立ててみたこれはすごいわ<笑>何かおかしい補正おいサーリーズおいもしかしておいこっそり着用したいなこれ<笑>着用したいよこれ<笑>ジロシマガンメイチューテイアンスパーズロシポーチセターダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダダもしかして単独の件格上げ総務省に答申してませんかなあ答申中かお予算も組みかそれか一般紹介金お前もあったかなポップは元から2人もやったかなあ
待望の感覚ですいやこれは俺やんねん。無事にフライトール出した。まあ、長島みゆみとハンメイミやって。四月に行ったんや。こんな行ったら。こういう下はにやさ。もう帰ってこって。対象がやった。何だこれ予算か。あ、もしかして増えたか。組んだかあやっぱりなあやっぱりなあやっぱりなあやっぱりなあやっぱりなあやっぱりなあやっぱりなに咲いてるのやっぱりな。<笑>全国から増えたかなやっぱりサンドイッチマンもそう思ったら福島県とは三重県ああそうだったでどんかこれは楽勝問題もいいたたたたかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかえー、5時からやる。8時からいいんじゃないか。そうやっぱりな、最大のものができたいからな。どういったドリームが先決補正。増えたか
So bringing trilateral to Slovenia means also bringing Slovenia to trilateral. And as you know, David Rockefeller Fellows had a free program. It is our pleasure that we have the Amcham breakfast with Slovenian Business Society. They were talking about the global issues and how we connected the world with some local representatives and even some members of trilateral. It is also our pleasure that the former Prime Minister, who is the current Minister for Foreign Affairs, Dr. Miro Cerar, had the time to meet with them and discuss where the Europe is today and where the Europe is going. And of course, we have finished our program with amazing time with Professor Dan Azor. Yes. 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 放置してたけど、あっかくさ。ね、こうする、買収計画だったね。どうにもない。もしかして出身
It's mostly Has pictures of tension. A there quantum are, leader is self-aware. A quantum leader so celebrates those, diversity. Is a quantum okay. leader okay. asks fundamental questions. Uh, always questioning him or herself. Questioning the norm. Questioning the norm. This is the edge of chaos. Shakes things up. Who thrives on uncertainty? Who thrives on chaos? Uh, a quantum leader is filled with compassion. Uh, and a quantum leader feels called to the start of the third. There's a sense of purpose. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
the authoritarian, it's interesting, the authoritarian regimes all place their money to abroad. これ新しいよ。セーブ。数年前にこれもさ、たぶん2019年ぐらい。厳しくない。でっかい。本当に言ってたのかなと疑った。やはりこっそりこの委員たちに議論したかやっぱり議論したか政党の場合はめっちゃ面白いからだからエミ新聞の意外と三菱 UFA 社の信託金庫が議論したかいやっぱりあの、新山公園、新山公園のマイトピアの、ちょっとサーリーさんに買い取ってさ、このままのさ、全然気を議論しちゃうたカジマのな甲子園みたいなさ、日本語のってたはい、みんな最初からね、意外と